The Spin-Off Podcast Network. This is Kiwi is back for a brand new season with more inspiring kōrero from special guests including rugby player, father and role model TJ Peronara. My family bring me joy. Rugby brings me joy too, but it's not the same joy as my family brings me. And global dancer and choreographer Kirsten Dodgen. For some reason people think I'm very intimidating. Listen to the new season of This Is Kiwi, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in collaboration with Kiwi Bank. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spin-Off. You can help us keep all of The Spin-Off's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. How do you know? Yeah, I, I Googled it. Okay. I, I've been reading a recap this whole time. <laughs> Koto, welcome to the Real Pod. It's ladies' night, not on mass, but and the feelings right, <laughs> but certainly in. Well, I wouldn't say the studio because we're very much not in the studio. My name is Jane Yeg. I'm joined remotely. I'm remote. Alex is remote. Uh, Samuel is in situ in the studio, um, which makes no sense because we're the two people. Our voices are being. You, you should say something, Samuel, to make it all worthwhile being in that lovely soundproof room. I think it's really funny that, like, so Kelly Clarkson has a segment on her show, The Kelly Clarkson Show, where she does Kelly Oki, where she covers famous uh, people's songs. And I think that's, like, got to be the biggest fear if I was an artist, that Kelly Clarkson would come in and just eat me up, like, would just absolutely <laughs> devour my song. <laughs> so is this a covers album? <laughs> I would love a Kelly Clarkson covers album. I'm just, I haven't heard anyone talk about Kelly Clarkson. Oh, she's still good. She's still real good. Anyway, um, thanks, Samuel. Appreciate that. Duncan is in absentia. He's got commitments on the outside. He's got commitments in um, Mexico. Are Mexico. we allowed to talk about that? I don't know. <laughs> we just did. We just did. We just laying it out there on the couch, just like that. There are no rules. Um, yeah, he's he's away, like properly having a holly bob, and we're not. You're in, in lovely sunny Christchurch by the looks. It looks nice and bright. I'm in lovely sunny Auckland, um, but I have a sick child again, and it's killing me. I mean, it's worse for her than it is for me, but I just want to be in the office. Just sick. Ch- oh, there. did you hear that? It's just a little cough on cue, which oh. is nice. Not COVID, though, is it? Not COVID? No, not yet. Not yet. We continue to test, and I'll keep you updated. Um, we are going to be talking about the final week of maths which was an absolute stunner, huge week this week. Uh, We had vows, we had reunion. In Australia, it played out over two weeks. We got it all jam-packed into one. Um, I didn't realise this was happening. It's like we've (laughs) been spoiled. It's like Easter's coming, we're about to gorge ourselves on chockey, and we've gorged ourselves on maths to get ready for the the sugar highs. It was, I feel actually emotionally exhausted. <laughs> so do I. And we watch will, binging all of these. <laughs> we, will, uh, we will dive into it all a little bit later on in the show. But first of all, let's have some real news. So last week I caught a plane down to Christchurch to visit Alex and do some work. Lovely time for a little bit. Now, how much of it was lovely? Would you say was there like one to two minutes of loveliness? No, no. I mean, we had a we had a nice time at the cafe. Had a nice time. Everything was fine at the cafe. So I think um, the, the first problem was that I arrived and I knew it was going to be raining in Christchurch, but I didn't know it was going to be cold. Right. Mm. So it was like seven degrees during the daytime, and I came not prepared. So you were in your bikini, up. weren't you? <laughs> I was, just like it was another <laughs> another beautiful summer Christchurch day. And <laughs> turned up at the cafe. Alex, you arrived laden with jacket options for me, my my knight in shining armour. <laughs> well, I felt, I felt bad for you. I was also very um, affronted and distressed because not only did I have 
yourself and Noel McCarthy in, in my beautiful city, my mum and my stepdad were also arriving to stay. And, you know, when you're in a new place and you're trying to dazzle people, you don't want, hmm, maybe the worst weather <laughs> on record <laughs> to strike. And so I was very keen to make sure everyone was having a nice time. So I thought if I just provide you with as many jackets as I was physically <laughs> able to hold, <laughs> we might be able to turn the ship around. Unfortunately, things only got worse. <laughs> things only got worse. None, none of this is your fault. For a start, the weather packed in the moment we arrived and it cleared up the moment we left. So I definitely feel like we brought some of that Auckland summer with us, um, just to use the trope. But I was supposed to be going off and doing an interview with someone. I was supposed to be taking a meeting with you. We got to the accommodation where we were meeting and I instantly got the belly upsets. Real <laughs> bad. Like I have <laughs> never I have never known the term green around the gills to be a literal <laughs> description. You looked so bad that I was taking photographs of you, wasn't I? You were. That was, and that's the appropriate response. If you see someone very ill and, and quite distressed about it, please take photos of them. It will always <laughs> be met with uh, with nothing but appreciation. Um, it's all true. She did. She took. She she memorized the moment before I excused myself for basically the rest of the trip. I was And that tipped. photo, I mean, I, I felt very, you were genuinely very, very ill and I feel terrible, terrible about that. Um, but that photo will be joining the other photo I've got. <laughs> the last time you were in Christchurch with me, when we did that hilarious live pod at the art gallery, and then I took a photo of you lying in your, like, tightly made little hotel bed with a sheet and you look like a dead body in a morgue. You yeah, really do. Yeah. Just I probably looked better this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I've got a bit of a thing going on there, but I, I, I maintain we'll get there. I'll come to Christchurch one day and, it, look, as long as I'm not sick, I don't care if it's raining, I don't care if the wind's blowing, as long as we're together, Alex, and I'm not mm. sick, that's fine. The problem was we couldn't be together. I, was, I don't want to make no. you sick. No one needed Tragedy. to see me in the state that I was in. Anyway, so that was a disaster. But and great news for me, I found a new game addiction. Um mm. I, I go through phases where I just like I play one game constantly and that's it, right? So mm -hmm. I've done like, you know, I've done the candy crushes and the that kind of thing. I've done bedazzled, bejeweled, whatever it's called. Um, I've been through battle cats, you know, all of these things. Most recently, since about October last year, it's been League of Legends Wild Rift, which is quite a complicated game. Um, and Sounds just, complicated. just this weekend, I discovered Slither.io, which is the simplest game you can possibly imagine. Samuel knows it. This is, you posted this in Slack, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm absolutely boss at Slither. Are you? I got to number eight uh, in the rankings this morning. Um, had a great run. Oh, I, I, can, I, can, I can win easily. I can get to number one, no problem. Oh, I can imagine you in there. Basically, for those who are uninitiated, it's like... It's kind of like snake on your Nokia phone on crack. And instead of snakes, it's worms, which it's kind of like a, um, a, a worm farm hunger games because it's kill or be killed. And you can survive just eating like the tiny little berries. But really, if you want to grow and you want to own it, you've got to eat the carcasses of the, the other worms that get destroyed. And it can either be the ones that you kill yourself or you can – go in and try and eat like someone else's kill. It's I've made it sound really gruesome. It's not. It's all just like, like nice, bright neon dots and things. Um, but it's really addictive. But the great thing is, having come from Wild Rift, we have to sit in a fucking lobby and wait for enough team members to join and then load out and all that carry on. You just press go and you're in the game and you're in. And it's just, it's it's a, the game's constantly going and you just like jump on in at any point. I love it. It's very emotional. I find it like when you jump in and there's like, when I was playing, there was about 300 people. And I was like, look at us all. There's all these cute little, all those little cuties from around the world just having to slither around. And then I got Don't eaten be fooled. within like five yeah. seconds. <laughs> I know. Don't be fooled. Oh, my God, I would love to play with you guys. Let's have a play night of Sliver. Would we know? Would sometimes. we all be in the slame, 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 <laughs> same, same Sliver session? Or is it different? Are they like different pockets, you know? I think you can play with friends, so I just need to figure out how. But also everyone seems to have things about New Zealand and stuff in their name, so I feel like they have geographical servers. 
when when did the real pod become a gaming podcast i think it's good for us to diversify you know yeah. tv is unreliable i think if we've got gardening and gaming and a couple more things i've had a hel- absolutely hilarious uh gardening outcome um I planted, well, I've been using a lot of pea straw as mulch, and now I'm growing all these hilarious peas everywhere. Oh. <laughs> and nobody saw coming, certainly not me. So, like edible and now peas? I've got pea crops. Yeah, I think so. I'm just going to leave them in there and see what happens. Because the pea straw is accidentally little, growing things. This is crazy. Little dried peas in it, I know. So, if anyone needs a pea, come see me in about um, 100 days. <laughs> I did a really cool thing. When I was planting, someone in the corner actually put us onto this uh, place called Bulb Direct in which you can buy bulbs ahead of time. You order them and then they deliver them around the right time to plant them and all this. And I, I bought a whole load of bulbs and um, was really disappointed to learn that each bulb only produces one flower. Um, mm. But that's fine. That's just me being a noob. But the worst part was <laughs> I planted, I don't even know what they were. I planted something. Um, they didn't take, I think they were ranunculars, they didn't take, but some weeds were growing up because I did it in a pot and some weeds were growing mm. up. And for ages I was tending to these fecking weeds thinking oh. <laughs> that they were my ranunculars coming through. Oh, no. So they were flourishing, like, yeah. they were thriving. <laughs> they were thriving. I was like, these are going great guns. I wonder when they're going to flower. <laughs> I I am in a position now where I've got like I've got my tiny radishes popping up and there's also weeds around them and I don't know my ass from my elbow you know I'm terrified to touch anything so I'm just letting it all hang loose I am not qualified to advise quite clearly (laughs) so someone else someone else please help Alex um (laughs) another big news today FM got shut down pretty oh my god in a pretty major way last week girl so young and old I mean Horrific, but what compelling audio that is. <laughs> I mean, renegade like radio, right? I'm imagining them like padlocking the door shut so that, you know, someone gets out their bike lock or something, shuts the door so that the, the CEO can't bash his way through and they're all crowded around the microphones, literally going down with the ship and, and swearing the situation. on the oh, I love, love a... It. I, I feel awful for the people involved, but I do love a live on air not going according to plan, you know? Like when I think it was like Liz Gunn who has in herself not gone according to plan, but she did a, um, she quit the breakfast show on TV, TV one, like just on air, no one knew that she was about to do it. Um, mm. There must be, we, we should do a little roundup of all the, the various times people have just. When, when Hilary Barry cried, heat. when she cried, at, 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 like reading the John Campbell news, just oh, any time, yes. especially even when like talkback is pretty chaotic and unscripted and today FM is pretty loose as it is. But, you know, it was kind of just like this next level, completely unfiltered, unguarded, like, let's do this. I Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, you must be distraught, Jane, as well, as one of today FM's biggest fans. I actually received a uh, a card from the publicist at Christmas time. Literally, the only Christmas card I received, and it said <clears throat> to Today FM's number one fan. And so I'm framing that. Um, wow. I yeah, I am. I'm Devo. I listen to Today FM in the car. I don't you when I you know come into work and go home from work. So you know, approximately twenty minutes a day. But still, that's the most radio I listen to and have listened to for the longest time. What are you um, going to replace it with? I don't know. I've honestly not, like, I've honestly just not been listening to anything in the car. And that's how sad I am. Just silence. Not your own I tried. Thoughts. Jesus. No. Uh, yeah. I, I've tried. <laughs> I tried other things, um, but nothing. It's too soon, honestly. It's too I just need some space and time to process. Mm, I have actually got an interview. Hopefully by the time this podcast is up, I've interviewed my own dear dad because he listens to Today FM from well, uh, can, non-stop. My dad is so one he of those is, people He's literally has, the number one fl- fan, isn't he? I should send him the card. He has a little ear. He, he's one of those people that just has a little earpiece in all the time. <laughs> and there is always today a fair blasting. So he listens through the night, listens to Smalley, First Light. He listens to Ghana, Tova. Wow. He loves it all. And he is, um, he's like very... He doesn't love the fact he's had to go back to RNZ. You know, he says it's a mm. bit vanilla. <laughs> he's lost his mates, hasn't he? 
lost his friends, his friends and his ears. He could just listen to the real pod on repeat. There's plenty of back cat for him to go through. That's a That's good time. true. Well, he's one of the biggest fans. He's already listened. He's listened to every app already. You know. Oh, bless him. Oh, anyway, you need guy. to tell me. Have you, have you had any um, any hilarious encounters? Have you tripped over anything? Have you accidentally um, bought something off someone famous? I actually have had a pretty quiet week, aside from you know the big flare up with you in Christchurch. That was huge. <laughs> <laughs> Towards a flare but no, up. I mostly had like I've had me a. Uh, me mum and family staying, so it's been a bit, you know, been a bit, been a bit homebody. Oh, you watched Vows with your mum, though, didn't you? I did, and I've, I was, uh, of course, she was on the record the whole time. She understands that if you're in a room with me, you're on the record, and I've got some Perla quotes from her. <laughs> okay, well, let's dive in. I am disgusted at how much you have copied my husband. <laughs> you just fucked. Don't even Reality check. It's over. It's over, Alex. O V A H over. It's sad, but what a journey we've had, you know? I find it so emotional when you see them, everyone come back for the reunion. And everyone's learned a bit, everyone's reflected a bit, everyone's got a spray tan. <laughs> And everyone's had their teeth done. <laughs> they all look so amazing all the time. So from my understanding, they make out that, uh, that it's like two months after the experiment has ended, but I believe it's one month after the experiment has ended. So not tons of time, but enough time to send some sexts, apparently, to get your willy out at a uh, at a nightclub and, and FaceTime someone. Just, I mean, this has been a really massive season there's been a heck of a lot of drama there's been some beautiful love stories and it's just been mm-hmm. non-stop I mean I think there was maybe one week that was probably running at about 88 percent and then the rest was all like 99 it's been hectic completely incredible and also very I feel like the show has been very good at um wrapping up storylines in a way that like past seasons haven't like everyone's kind of getting their comeuppance or their redemption or retribution and maybe that's just because the show goes on for 17 million years <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> they've just got the luxury of time and we're going to get the luxury of time back uh now that the show's not on air anymore but that's cold comfort really because i'm going to miss all my friends and enemies um but we ha- we start off with vows who should we start with should we just get should we get tani and ollie out of the way um yeah the beautiful love story they were trying to seed. They were trying to seed this like jeopardy. <laughs> oh, they live a little bit far apart, you know. Maybe Ollie will have to rethink this. Meanwhile, Ollie is so clearly like, as he said later, he would move to a forbidden island or something <laughs> to be with Tani. Um, <laughs> and they had the most beautiful vows ever. I mean, Tani was very emotional, saying she'd found her best friend. And even Ollie, who's like a bit of a joker, got a tear in his eye, blamed it on his allergies, but we know the truth. Um, they are in love. They are in love. He's moving to Sydney. It's it's all on. I still want to know about the fate of the fish. I don't feel like that storyline was wrapped up with a bow, um, but I'm very, very happy for them. Everyone adores them. I adore them. And they are, they're just so fun and funny as well. Like, I don't know, Jules and Cam had a similar, like, perfect story arc a few years back, but I just feel like Tani and Ollie have been way more entertaining because it can it can get a bit boring mm-hmm. when they're just having a nice time. But I don't know, these two were fun. I hope that Ollie gets a radio deal or something out of this because he's genuinely oh, he's the funniest guy ever. When he did that extremely long John Aiken impression, just like the mother of all impressions to top off an incredible season of impressions, and he was, like, dissecting, like, John Aiken's little quirks and stuff. And I was like, you could do a master class in acting, you know, and I would watch it and I'd be impressed. He's just great. I really love Ollie. Yeah, me too. They're definitely my fave couple out of the back of this. Um, we also had Melinda and Leighton who, oh, this was nice. I mean, this was, as Duncan said, a, a very real kind of a relationship in terms of its rockiness, um, the fact that they could fight and then sort of make up, and I'm sure it's going to be a tumultuous time in their household three days a week approximately, but they they clearly are very fond of each other. They want to make it work. They see a long-term future together, and the vows were really nice. I didn't 
think that they were going to break up. I did think that they would stay together, but I really appreciated, um, oh my God, I've forgotten his name already, Leighton. I, f- I really appreciated Leighton having some self-reflection and, and admitting that he had been uh, a little bit closed off, a little bit this is- logical. Because I think we got a bit of a recap at the start about his, you know, analytical mind and all of this. And this was a great recap for my mum, who, of course, had not seen a moment of the show. And she immediately was just like, if he stands up there and says, I'm sorry, I think she will die for him. <laughs> I was just like, out of nowhere. You literally do not know these people. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's not wrong, though. She wasn't wrong. She's, no, she's wrong. Very, very perceptive, my mum. And when they decided to stick it out, I did have a quibble about one thing Melinda said in her vows, where she said, I love how you make me feel loved without loving me at all. I know. (laughs) That's not not acceptable. (laughs) (laughs) But look, it's ultimately fine. They're they're in love. Um, Mum says, this is why this show is top rating over the news. We all love, love, love stories. I love, love. You love, love. This is her pointing around the room now. Joe loves, love. Susan Boyle loves, love. At this point, my mum is also crying. Like, just so involved in this show after, I think, seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> How is she not watching it if she's enjoying the vows so much? Oh, she's been in the You think she man. would love... Do you think she? Do you think she'd love the other elements that aren't about love? Because the yeah. vows is probably misleading. No, my mum. Li- my mum lives for the. My mum lives lives for the drama. <laughs> oh God, she's got to um, get There was on board. a little thing I noticed. So after the vows, they were like, you know, we're looking to the future. We're thinking about two boys and an Italian greyhound. By the reunion, cavoodle. What changed? Yeah, and and five children. Oh my God, five just kids by the reunion. Going so, bigger and I mean, better. But if, just by the time they blum and by next year's day, Daily Mail piece, there'll be 17 children and a running an animal rescue. Um, <laughs> they can't seem to not take digs at each other, though, even when they're being being nice and lovey-dovey. Like in, in all their moments to camera, you know, there's always like just little snide remarks. But I feel like that's really realistic and relatable. Yeah. Where to it's- next? Um, oh. Oh, should we get like Rupert and Evelyn out of the way? Just the sort of, ex- oh, yeah. maybe the quickest vows in um, Married at First Sight history. Just complete non-event, not a surprise. They didn't work out. Um, I thought that Evelyn seemed weirdly a little bit confrontational as if something had gone wrong. I mean, it's more that nothing actually went right, but I don't feel like Rupert ever had any bad intentions or anything, you know? No, he's just a stumbly guy. And, you know, I did feel a little bit bad because I'm sure that lots of people trip over their vows and have second goes at it. (laughs) And the the editors very generously cut out them (laughs) mucking up. Rupert got a pretty brutal edit when he was reading out his vows because he did not do the best, you know, not the greatest delivery we've seen. No, Um, But that's kind of, that's Rupert's thing. It is his thing. He's, he's, uh, He's not calm under pressure, and that's okay. He's just a genuine, nervous fellow. And I think that Evelyn being so sure of herself and so beautiful and so confident only amplifies that, and the contrast just makes it seem so much worse. Uh, but but they, they're mates as. It's fine. Friends, yeah. friends for life. Okay. How many others have we got? Well, Is it just Lyndall and Cam? Lyndall and Cam. Alyssa and Duncan. Oh, Alyssa and Duncan. Oh, dear. <laughs> Saved some real pillars for last year. <laughs> okay. I just cannot Alyssa- believe the narrative that Alyssa has built up in her head about what this relationship was, who Duncan is, this whole net thing of like he's wearing a mask and I've oh. seen through it. Where did she get this it's- from? I don't know. It's a very good mask. Very, like if you're in the market for a mask, find out where Duncan goes because it's extremely convincing. They've done a lot of editing with Duncan and Alyssa in the recent weeks where she's absolutely tearing him apart and then sort of referencing kind of behaviour that is extremely obvious to her, but then they'll cut to him talking and he's being nothing but genuine and lovely and displaying behaviour that's the exact opposite of what she's describing. Um, I feel like producers were not <laughs> Alyssa fans. Mm-mm. You know, I, I think her, her story arc was pretty brutal, um, but also we have to assume she did, you know, she said all these things. 
And she did, and we did get a little bit of self reflection at the end. But I was also oh, proud right of Duncan. right at the end. Oh yeah, like oh. one tiny, tiny glimmer. Um, but I was proud of Duncan. I mean, Duncan has handled this so well for something so kind oh. of infuriating and stressful and emotional, you know. And even his final vows were like very well put together. I thought even down to the fact that she was obviously devastated when he said, you know, the gap between us is too big to bridge, I, I you know, for, for the both of us, whatever. I think we have to say mm. goodbye. And she kind of broke down and it was just this long, awkward silence. And then he just went, do you want a tissue? <laughs> Which is exactly what he said to her on their wedding day when she started Aww. crying. And I was just like, ah, oh, there's no moment sums up the, like, you know, the thoughtfulness, just the holistic hotness of Duncan. <laughs> it was just beautiful. And there's a lot of calls now for him to be The Bachelor. You know, yeah. that, that is happening but across the internet. He may be, ta- he may be taken. By whom? Have you not seen The Daily Mail? No. I have not I have seen avoided. The Daily Mail. I've avoided everything until I watched everything and then I jumped on the Daily Mail and he's been spotted a couple of times out <gasps> with Evelyn. Oh. They've been dancing in the nightclubs, fully clothed, I might add, as possible. And, yeah, they they uh, they say there's nothing going on, they're just friends, but also she said something like we haven't explored that yet. It's very similar to what Taylor, um, Taylor <laughs> said. <laughs> the Taylor <laughs> totally clause. Just like, yeah. So... I I remain hopeful. I would love to see these two together. I have to say, I love that. Seeing seeing Duncan's outfits and then seeing him like shirtless in a nightclub wearing another questionable get up. I'm just like he he is. I agree. He's the worst dressed guy on the show. I can overlook it, but he definitely is. He had a, another couple of bad outfits this week, and there were only a couple of episodes. You know, they're very shiny, like satiny blazer. He just gets away with mm. it though, with the face. He Who's does looking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the personality of a saint, an actual saint. Yeah, um, incredible. But Alyssa no, Alyssa, said, do, do, do we go on to the dinner party and all that at this point as well? We're just talking about them yeah, as a couple. Yeah, I think because, let's just go, go all the way through okay. it. Okay. Because, you know, along with him wearing this glorious mask, um, she said that in his vows, this is what she told the girls before he arrived, um, he said he doesn't have feelings for me. He's been in love and this ain't it. That's not what he said at all. What he said is, I don't want to hurt you anymore and I don't want to keep getting hurt. Mm -hmm. Never once did he say, she's just making stuff up. Completely making stuff up. And I do think that everyone knows that. Like the rest of the girls were not fighting. Sandy and Linda were just like, okay. (laughs) Well, that's because they were like, I wish I had been coupled up with Duncan, you know? And Yeah. Yeah, she's definitely... um, she self sabotaged the relationship because he was there for it. He's put up with a lot. I, you know, I think even if their final date had happened differently, they might have made it through final vows in one piece. But right to the very last, she was pushing it as far as she possibly could to see what he would, you know, how committed he was. And he basically called her bluff on it. Mm-hmm. And even with her saying awful things, like screaming him down at the dinner party not letting him be responsible for the narrative, not that he was, I mean, all he was doing was telling the truth, but he never insulted her. He never reacted. He even defended it and is in the moment saying, you know, obviously she's upset and we say things when we're upset that are hurtful, so I understand. And it's just like, he's like Cam was complete opposite when stuff like that happens to him. And this this guy is just a, a dream. He is a dream. I just, yeah, Alyssa was trying to, it was like she was just throwing shit at a wall <laughs> and trying to see, like she was throwing out these sound bites like, you know, he wanted to, he wanted a princess, but I'm a queen. And I'm literally just like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you <laughs> saying? This is of no relevance <laughs> to any of what has happened in your relationship. And then when she he was came all over the, the place. party and she had been just like shit talking oh. him behind his back. And then she came in and was like, hi, and gave him a hug. And then was like, he gave me the ick. He's so fake. It's just unbelievable. Well, she like, gave him a hug as well. She did it <laughs> like over his shoulder to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then challenged him on his because he said that he had reached you know, she's like I haven't heard from him he's like oh well actually I reached out to say if you want to talk and if you don't want to talk I completely understand um you know I'm here for you and she's like 
you said, I'm obviously here for you. And he's like, okay, yes, I did. That's right. I did say that. Caught me out, I guess. And then she was like, oh, you just Googled what to um, put in your text. I Googled. I Googled some of uh, what was in the text just to see if he had Googled it um, and, and seen if there is a, you know, an advice page on what to say when you've broken up with someone and just reaching out to see if they're okay. Didn't come up. So Didn't come up. The evidence Amazing. is not there. Unlike the evidence that is in Harrison's pocket. Yeah, yeah. Alyssa should have brought more printouts. That was her fatal flaw. Not enough props. <laughs> Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, senior writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Spark Business Lab. Kia ora, this is Toby Manhire, here to urge you to tune in to Gone by Lunchtime, a podcast with me, Annabelle Lee Mather and Ben Thomas, tackling the world of New Zealand politics, from policy to polling, from scandal to psychodrama. Listen to Gone by Lunchtime, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, wherever good pods are sold. Shall we go to Bronte and, uh, oh, we haven't done Lindor and Cam yet, but let's just, I think we just, let's just sideline into Bronte and Harrison, because weirdly, they didn't get a couch session. No, and I loved this because I think what happened to them, that absolute um, just dismantling of Harrison at the dinner party by everyone just laughing in his face at him saying, you're such a loser. Why did you print out this like nothing message and bring it? Um, Was like just a perfect place to end it kind of. (laughs) Yeah. There was a definite power in numbers kind of thing going on there because I feel like there were a lot more people who – previously or during the course of the experiment would have thought and felt those things about Harrison but just kind of kept quiet not getting involved Mm -hmm. but this being the last ever dinner party like literally everyone can see how ridiculous it is they all just jumped on board the the lull wagon and I was thinking oh there's probably a lot of clever editing here to make it seem a lot worse than it was but there's a moment where He's like, guys, guys, no, listen to me, guys. And he, the whole table is cracking up. And he's like, oh, I'm trying to talk and you're all just taking the, oh. And they just like laughed him down. Like it was. It was amazing. Quite sensational. Uh, and the, and so, um, who fo- someone folded his like evidence. So he had printed out this exchange with Bronte messaging this famous girl on the outside from the very beginning of the show about what their relationship was like. And he thought that was like this crazy smoking gun of Bronte being <laughs> some sort of psycho and it was just nothing and everyone read it was like oh yeah that's all good and Harrison was like but you don't get it and then Cam folded it into a paper plate and threw it at Harrison's yeah. head it really it really took out took the wind out of his sails didn't it and then if, if, just everyone just finding it so funny that he'd printed it out and it was really, you know, it was like an Instagram exchange. It was like really big and uh, Claire's like, I'm honestly surprised he knows how to use a printer and Ollie's saying, have you ever seen anyone use props? But just peered alongside, honestly, Harrison standing there with this bit of paper, holding it up and is in the moment being like, I've got the dirt. This is going to out Bronte and show her for the woman that she actually is. And this is the reason our relationship fell apart. You know, uh, it was honestly magical, magical television and definitely the highlight of the dinner party for sure. A beautiful end for also just someone who's so frustrating in the way that, and so impossible to kind of pick apart because the way he's conducted himself throughout the experiment has been so sort of insipid and strange that sometimes all you can do is just like laugh at how ridiculous he is. And, mm. you know, it's impossible to kind of get Harrison any other way and this was the perfect way to bring him down. I actually wonder, do you reckon he went to like warehouse stationery to print that out? Oh, yeah, he, I don't think he's got a printer at home. Do you think he's got he's a producer? It. Maybe he got a producer to print it. Maybe, maybe, it's true. He probably doesn't know how to use a printer. Or Yeah, it's, it is wild, though. It's just <laughs> very, very funny. Um, before we get into, into Cam and Lindell, should we just chat about some of the other people who were at the dinner party who didn't really 
I mean, it's sad. We we saw them for fleeting moments, but we really didn't get anything from them. Um, being Shannon and Caitlin, they were there. They didn't <sighs> nothing even, from them. Nothing. Eh? Um, there was a bit from Dan and Sandy, uh, and obviously we saw them on the couch. There was who else was there? Oh, Melissa. Well, uh, Melissa, and, Melissa Josh. and Josh. Melissa came in with this sort of thing of like mama bears back. And I was like, I don't think anyone has ever said that you're mama bear in human history. <laughs> no, also, interestingly, like she's like, I'm single and ready to mingle. I'm like, there's no one here for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is not where you're going to meet your next person. John Aiken, yeah. probably taken, you know, all the other, they're all, they all, <laughs> they know too much. <laughs> Try yeah, somewhere else. Yeah, it's just strange. And isn't it funny, though, how quickly we can kind of forget all these people, like these characters? When it was Melissa and Josh's kind of moment in the sun on maths, it mm. felt like the most important thing in the world. And mm. now I'm just like, who is she? <laughs> we didn't even get Josh to hear. I don't um, think Josh even talked. Well, no, we just saw him in the car arriving, basically saying he's got comfy pants on. Um, <laughs> he just wanted to be comfy. <laughs> during the war but yeah there was nothing you know they didn't end up on the couch or anything um and we didn't see much of Adam and again for a couple that were really like involved in some central drama we didn't see a lot of them um Sandy and Dan when they were on the couch this was a highlight moment for me purely in terms of television when uh they played back Hugo explaining what had happened with the butt dial and the, some of the things that actually had been said. And John, you know, went to Hugo and said, did those things happen? Did it happen like that? And he was sort of like, yeah. And Dan was <laughs> outed, had no way of backing out of this. And he just whipped his head around and looked at Hugo with the most hitman look I have ever seen. It was yeah. actually terrifying. Completely chilling. His face almost like morphs. Like, do you remember that old Instagram filter where it's like your face would turn into like a dragon slowly? It's like if you froze that halfway through, that's Dan's face in those moments. Like he turns yeah. and he just, it's like anamorphs. But I loved how Sandy was like, don't try and intimidate him. Don't look at mm. him like that. And don't you dare look at me like that. I know what you're trying to do. And I was just like, yes, Sandy. She, he, yeah. he was just completely destroyed, like. And the experts did not let him get away with it. No, Sandy's amazing, and I'm so pleased that her family have welcomed him back and looked after her, and she's going to find herself someone awesome. Um, I'm flicking through bits of actual paper. I took notes on paper like a genuine reporter, but the problem is now I don't know where anything is. You do Harrison, notes on paper. Do you have stuff through this? I am Harrison. I, well, I actually do my notes, and then I and then I uh, process them and in, in typing them up. There's a little peek behind the curtain oh. there. Far too much time oh, invested in this. Um, Jesse and Claire is all we've got left, Jane. No, we haven't spoken about Lyndall and Cam yet, but yes. Oh God. Let's do Jesse and Claire. Because I'm so I've got some I've got some stuff that I've read on the internet that I'm I'm very confused about. Tell me, tell me. Well, Jesse and Claire, so basically, you know, they broke up, they came back to the reunion, both really looking forward to seeing each other. She says they've been talking every day. He insinuates that, you know, maybe there's a possibility that something could actually come out of the back of this, that perhaps there is hope for them after all. They have the longest of long hugs at the dinner party. It's just lovely. Then they get on the couch, say lovely things about each other. Watch back their recap, which is horrendous <laughs> to watch um, and doesn't also show any of GC being the prick that he was at the beginning because he really was he was awful to her we did get a little bit beginning. of him going you know at the honeymoon saying wow look at the sunset you know kind of making fun of her yeah but there wasn't a lot of context everything. around it it was literally mm. just him saying oh look at the water look at the sunset and then she goes you're not my person and walks off so it almost showed her it almost seemed like if you watched that in isolation you didn't know what he's talking about it could look like she was just overreacting but it was it did not look good for her at any point anyway. Um, but they, you know, so they, they ended, they, they were kind of almost holding hands, you know, it's lovely, they're friends, you know. But then I go online and see that Jesse has been commenting on po like maths posts saying that in terms of the reunion dinner, that they hadn't been talking every day, that it, the edit had been a total stitch up and that, 
he'd said lots of stuff that they didn't include and they misconstrued things. And I'm really confused oh. by that because then, I mean, what happened on the couch? Like, yeah, I just well, what was the, the final note was he, I, he was like, I have no parting words for Claire because she's coming to Perth. But, like, what yeah. does that mean? <laughs> I think she's probably, I, I think given this context that I have now, I feel like he's probably just saying, like she's on a work trip to Perth or something and they're going to, you know, there's no parting words because I'm going to see her again soon. But it's not a, it made it sound like she's moving to Perth, eh? Like It really did. <laughs> and yeah. they just like chopped so either, bits around it. <laughs> either he was on, after the dinner party aired, either he was trying to send out a red herring to put everyone off the idea that they might be together to surprise them with this big thing at the on the couch or <laughs> he's just telling the truth. And, they, and they've and they just edited it in a way that will um, lead us to believe something nice is happening when it's not. She's going to Perth for a business meeting. <laughs> Who knows? And that's absolutely it. i got to say, though, it was great to see Jessie again. I oh, have this yeah, like, I mean, crazy crush on Jessie, which I cannot explain. It does not make any sense because... I've seen, I've seen the, I've seen him. You've I've seen, seen him the air guitar. I've seen him at his worst. <laughs> I've seen him rocking out. I actually think he'd probably be quite unbearable to be around. Uh-uh. But what a character on the show, and what a, what an amazing personal journey. Like he genuinely had a lot of proper yeah. reflections on his early, you know, some of the stuff he said in his early days on the experiment and his high standards. He acted, he acted his, himself out. Totally, you know, his ex, ex <laughs> him, which is great. It's perfect. <laughs> Um, when they were watching back, I really noticed his face darken <laughs> and I was like, he went straight back to that place and I was like, oh, even if there had been a glimmer of hope, this might just be, I just feel like they're only ever one nail in the coffin away, you know, um, someone yeah. just bringing it up and he goes straight back there. So I don't have long-term hopes for them, even if they are hanging out. Yeah. Just quickly back to Melissa, cause he brought up the mama bear thing and it just mm-hmm. made me think of something. When we were on Treasure Island... Before we even went into the island, Wardy called me Mama, Be- Mama Bear. Really? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, that ain't it. Don't call me Mama Bear. That's, that's <laughs> not the one. I mean, I'm happy to be Big Mum on the podcast, but, you know. Of course. Hardly knew the guy. Um, but I reckon Wardy and Melissa would be a great couple. <laughs> oh, my God. I think they would be, they'd be perfect for each other. Wow. I love this. Cross-universe um, dating. Is Wardy... On the market. What he's spoken for. Yeah, okay. he is. Um, That's too bad. But, you know, yeah. Yeah, otherwise I'd be, yeah, I'd be trying to make that happen. <laughs> anyway, Lyndall and Cam. Oh, my oh, this God. this is so gross. We really saved a really, we're going to end on a really grot note, aren't we? Well, there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't a really, so, I think Jesse and Claire was supposed to be the big, like, wow, but we didn't really get it. Um, my mum did not like Cam. Straight off the oh, bat, funny said, what a self-centered <laughs> prick. <laughs> I hope she slices and dices him. Oh. That's my sweet old mum saying that. <laughs> well, she's, again, extremely clued up. It's, it, it, it's, like, it's a little bit like Harrison with Cam. It's like, it doesn't matter. Like, Lyndall did some amazing um, oration, but he just didn't, he just doesn't take it on board. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He just completely shuts it down, acts like he doesn't care, probably doesn't care. And so it's it's an unsatisfying delivery, I think. Um, yeah. He just gets defensive, but he's like yeah. not even very good at getting defensive. Like he has these no. weird little weak catchphrases where he's like, yeah, you, yeah, you get out of here. And you're like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it was horrible when... In the pre pre roll to the vows, and he was just saying like, "Yeah, I've been back and down. Yeah, no, I haven't missed, I haven't missed Lyndall at all. I just haven't missed, just like saying really unnecessarily nasty things, you mm-hmm. know? Like mm-hmm. he could have just said, he could have just not said it, or he could have said, you know, I miss her company, but I still know that she's not the one, or something like that. But he was just so mean. It was awful. Yeah." And he said he took, and of course, you know, 10 minutes to make his decision about what he was going to do at Final Vows and stuff. It was just all setting up for a, a bad end to Cam and he didn't even get to read out his Final Vows, which I thought was very no. cool. <laughs> I'm so pleased about that. I think that I, I would have just been squirming with rage in my seat and hearing whatever it was he had to say that would be blaming her for everything. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm so glad that she shut him down and then he just threw an absolute tantrum. Um and then, of course, we get to the dinner party and we find out 
that apparently Cam has been sexed. I mean, I have never heard the word sexting so much. I know. It feels quite um, like vintage. You know, it does. Sex, it's like cyber sex, you know? It's like just <laughs> old fashioned. <laughs> There was a lot of sexting talk because apparently Cam had been sexting Taylor and we kind of, this was no surprise, like when they said in the promo of someone's been sexting someone, like, well, it's obviously Taylor. They had this kind of like country vibe going between the pair of them early on. And also, and she has a sexting history. <laughs> she has a very strong sexting history. It's just one of her fave hobbies. And also, again, when she left the retreat that night, uh, there was that weird lingering hug where she had been a bit of a dick and Cam was like the only person who was like, oh, come in here, give us a hug. And it was just it felt felt very telling and foreshadowing. And here we are. The pair of them denying it, Cam doing um, a pretty locked up job, a watertight, you know, hard to argue with denial. Like, you know he's lying, but it's he just shuts it down. Taylor, on the yeah. other hand, written all over her face. <laughs> I mean, Taylor is just quite amazing. She just, like, she just cannot help the way that she is and the way that she feels about things. And she loves to just laugh and make jokes at her own peril, even when Lyndall talked about how um, Cam had made a joke during the experiment about having a threesome with Taylor. And everyone was like, oh, and Taylor was like, I'd be keen. <laughs> it's like, Taylor, just pick your battles. Like, <laughs> but she it's did of, say, she's an amazing character. She is. And she did say, I don't know, Lyndall. Like, she has so much less at stake for this coming out is just, like, not a big deal for her compared to what it is, like, you know, Australia is obviously just going to hate Cam because he was mm. the one who was in a relationship with this beautiful, amazing woman, um, whereas Taylor's relationship with Hugo was a fast from the word go, and even though Taylor doesn't appear to be a particularly nice person, it's not like we ever thought otherwise. Cam and Lyndall, at the beginning, I remember our first episode recapping, I was like, these two are going all the way, they're going to die, die old together, like it's just a lovely, happy situation, and God, yeah. I got it so wrong. Well, even watching back so the like wrong. supercut of their relationship and their wedding, like their wedding was beautiful. They genuinely mm. like seem to have this crazy connection, and you can even see it in their first interviews after they've been married. How much they're buzzing about each other, and just for it to kind of descend into this horrible sexting naked in a nightclub. <laughs> oh, <laughs> naked in a nightclub. What is he and she doing? Was, and also, didn't she <laughs> say at the dinner table, pretty sure she was like, well, yeah, well, I saw his cock. We don't know yeah. exactly the word she used. It was either dick or cock, because I feel like there was a k in there. <gasps> but she later said, I saw his willy. It's funny how it's like some words yeah. are beeped and some are like willy is all good. <laughs> <laughs> Cam was saying things like it wasn't a relationship, it was an experiment, which again, just dismissing everything that Lyndall, who was all in, um, was feeling, just undermining everything that she had said, felt all her emotions. Um, it's, it was it was difficult to watch and it was not satisfactory because he was being so casual and not just in the way he's sitting. Um, no. Remember when John said that to, you, to him? You're being so casual and he's like, what, how I'm sitting? Like, but kind of, yeah, the idiot. way you're sitting. Yeah, <laughs> as well. yeah, with that too. You know, there's the hugest man spread across that couch. Um, I just don't, I, I want to know more about the nature. So there was mention of the sexting and the nudes. Is the nudes purely this nightclub so cam apparently was on facetime with taylor at a nightclub was drunk took all his clothes off was dancing around and she saw this on facetime is that what the nudes are that we're referencing here or is there more i i think that's what people probably know about right like because he's there was apparently she heard through lindell heard through the grapevine through some of the dudes who he'd been gloating i mean i don't think that cam would have been gloating about sexting like I sent her a dick pic one time. I think that the, mm. he was probably gloating about more of a like a cross exchange. But I think the experts were kind of onto it when they were like, why is he FaceTiming her in a nightclub in the first place? Like you have yeah. to have a close relationship with someone to be doing, ringing them at like 11 o'clock at night or one in the morning, whatever it is. 
for them for for that to even take place in the first place. So there's no way that that was like an isolated incident. Also, didn't she say we've been FaceTiming every day or something? Yeah, at one point. So what's all that like, about? To the, in her in the moment. So he. He's just like caught in a big old lie. And I think given the fact that they're FaceTiming, you know, we know she has a penchant for the for the visual. <laughs> and um and you don't <laughs> you don't Facetime your mates all the time for no reason. Do you? Maybe it's they're not just like you're discussing every day. Discussing their passion for country music. For and Luke James. <laughs> I love the moment where um, Mel was like, now I just would like some clarification on something, Cam. And he leaned back and he's like, I got me dick out in a nightclub. <laughs> and she was like, that was not my question, <laughs> but thank you for sharing. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> and then Taylor did this thing where she was like, we haven't, you know, we haven't explored that yet. Says yet. Is it, and then catches herself and is like, oh, my God, I've given it all away. I've exposed mm. us. We've been sexting. We've got plans to get married and do lots of sexting. All she said was yet, and I don't really think anyone would have caught it as bad as she made it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Can we also <laughs> just for one moment, can we just give Leighton full props for his face this week? I have never seen him. <laughs> I mean, he does the face a lot, but the... I, I mean, it's, this is oh, a podcast, yeah. but you know the face I'm talking about. Just like the round-mouthed, shock, big eyes at everything <laughs> that everyone said, even when it was stuff that had been revealed already before. He just yeah. really was. Uh, he had good. He had good. Good face this week. It's good as well because his hair is gelled straight up. It looks like he's got a big fright. Like he's like <laughs> his hair's gone. His hair's <laughs> shot up so with true. the information. <laughs> he actually, I wrote down this week. I can't believe it's taken me this long. I think Leighton looks like if Bart Simpson was a real person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, like if he's he did a, a human Bart <laughs> CGI. Oh, it's just so good. But, yeah, that was, like, the big shock. And you're right, if she had just downplayed it. But that's what I mean is, like, Taylor just, like, she just cannot control what she says and how she reacts to things in this very pure way. Just unfortunately she's sort of this evil character. <laughs> yeah, she has no filter. It's true. No. <laughs> oh, God. And that's it. That's us. It's another 10th it's season. Can't of believe Mace it. You. Where are we going to go next with the pod, Jane? <sighs> Oh, We've got blow I up. I so even... blow up is the big thing that's replacing maths, the competitive <laughs> balloon art challenge coming to three. Um, I've got to sure say, from the promos, the no, it won't, but I, unless they use helium. But I've got to say from watching the promos that, you know, the structures are more impressive than I was anticipating. I was expecting a lot of poodles, you know. Mm-hmm. I was expecting a lot of just uh, just swords. long balloons. Swords. <laughs> <laughs> Get your sword out at the nightclub, but um, <laughs> but I I mean these are these are like you know works of art, so I think it'd be fun. I just don't think it's probably something we can recap. <laughs> Made some balloons look nice, you know. That'd be it each week. I we need to we need to think seriously about it, and we will. We'll have a pot every week, no matter what, even if it's just to talk about bloody Hunger Game, Worm Games, and uh, and gardening. Pea shoots. Yeah. What Surprise a season. Peas. It's been an incredible ride. Remains the greatest reality television show ever made. Cannot believe what the season has delivered for us. And, you know, you know it'll be coming back. I can't wait. I can't wait. Uh, before we go, before we finish the pod, we just need to take a quick trip into our favourite, our other favourite corner. Like, 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 and subscribe. Max Key is keyed up, which is a oh. horrible thought. <laughs> <laughs> what does keyed up mean? What does it mean? Is it about drugs? I thought keyed up meant you were like sexually aroused, you were horny. Is that right? I think that's like an insinuation, but I assume it's a play on... I assume he's a real estate broker, right? Okay. Isn't that the whole thing? Like, key, house key? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, I think he's just literally done a pun from his name, but when... Well, I, look, I listened yeah, to the last episode with Samuel I, Levi, I still think, and that was not about real estate. <laughs> 
No, no, I listen to not very much of it, but just I've just quickly looked up the, the dictionary definition of keyed up and it says nervous, tense or excited, especially before an important event. But I've definitely heard it used mostly in reference to like sexual endeavours, like someone's all keyed up, you know? Oh, my God. So Next I don't case. know. So- I don't know. It's just it's just the tiny bit ick for me to think about. But anyway, yes, he's got a podcast. It's quite fancy in terms of it's in a studio with, a, you know, a TV screen behind him. There's like video rolls out on Spotify when you go to listen to it. Um, and yes, his latest guest, uh, our um, beloved Samuel Levi, Levi, from Maths NZ Days. Which we haven't heard, you know, we haven't heard from him for a while. We have not discussed or perhaps even thought about Samuel Levi for a few years. Never before has the saying, yesterday's news is tomorrow's newspaper, been true than now. <laughs> Here we are with tomorrow's newspaper, Samuel Levi, on a podcast. It's amazing. In the what real actually, world in real time. What got my attention to listen back to Max Key is that I had two different people message me and say, oh, my God, Max Key is getting Andrew Tate on his podcast. It was an April Fool's joke. Mm. <laughs> it was but that just a goes, bad taste. He's still a crafty oh. wee troll, that Max Key. He loves his pranks. He's always loved his pranks. <laughs> oh, didn't he do something outside Lord's house once, like Doxter by accident? Yeah. He put up yeah. a for sale sign, I think, outside her house and, like, <laughs> Yeah, that was cool. Remember when like one of his friends had a goldfish on a Snapchat? That was awesome. <laughs> I have heard him talking about like, you know, in my younger days. And I'm like, you're still you're still a child. But this this podcast, I mean, I you know, I don't want to bring down others in our illustrious New Zealand podcast industry down. Good on him for giving it a hoon. Um but it is it was it was a funny listen. For what it's I heard, I didn't hear all of it. Fascinating listen. I have actually been chipping away at it in small blocks, <laughs> sort of five minute, five minute blocks to get through it. It's, um, I'd say they explore like a lot of territory that perhaps they are not particularly qualified to explore. <laughs> Definitely, like, yeah, there's some pretty crazy um, crazy bits of information thrown out there, I will say that. And it just makes me think at a point, maybe there should be like a podcasting standards authority. I don't know. But then I'd worry that we'd be on the chopping block Yeah, too. we would. I was going to say, in terms of people exploring things that they're not qualified to explore, we probably fall in that category too. But hopefully at least entertaining. I mean, I do think that this particular episode of the five minutes that I've heard of Max Key's podcast was entertaining, but I don't know if it would be as entertaining for anyone who doesn't listen to the real pod, you know? What we should say is, like, regardless of of the quality and perhaps some of the accuracy of some of the claims within the episode, there are some quite interesting parts about Married at First Sight New Zealand that Slevi kind of gets stuck into, yeah. They're running. They're running to listen to it, which means it's probably a good time for us to wrap up our podcast We'll free you up to go and get keyed up with Max Key um, at the very <laughs> beginning. I don't know if he he said at the very beginning he's like um, hosted by Stonewood Key and brought to you by Max Key. And I I'm not sure if he got those <laughs> the right way around, but it was cute. It was cute. <laughs> I've never stuffed up an intro ever in my life, so no. You know. And we we're brought to you by nobody. <laughs> right. <laughs> brought to you by absolutely nobody. <laughs> Mind you, if our parents, you know, were in a position, <laughs> if our parents were in a position to to sponsor us uh, and the Chow Brothers, then, you know, we'd probably be able to afford a nice a nice TV screen behind us and get top rating guests in like um, Samuel Levi. But alas, just us. Just us in our homes like sad losers. Thank you very much for listening <laughs> to us, though. Appreciate it. Thank you, Samuel. You've got a lot of editing to do on this one. Go well. Sorry, Samuel. Thank you, Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Alex. And um, we'll just say, just say a quick shout out to Duncan Grieve. Hi, because he's probably listening in Mexico, probably lying on the beach listening to this podcast. We miss you. We love you. Come back soon. Goodbye. Talo for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spin-Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network 
in partnership with KiwiBee. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.